you caused my heart to laugh and made my mouth to sing. And when you've got laughter in your heart, that's what it counts. When you've got real joy, real thankfulness to God, real appreciation for what God's doing and has done, a real understanding of what it means to be in life, a real comprehension of the ways of God, an understanding of who and what he is and what he's done for us. And so often, so many people, their hearts get so bowed down because they don't understand what it is that God has really done. And their lives are lives of misery instead of lives of laughter. Their hearts are hearts of sadness instead of hearts of joy. Their whole lives are centered around self instead of around God. Their whole understanding is wrong. And their whole being is caught up with the wrong thing. You know, as I've gone on in life, I've learned one thing. And that is to be a Christian is to be a happy person. There are tears, true. There are tears of worship and tears of love. Tears to express my gratefulness to God for his wonderful love and his mercy. There are tears of wonder when I wonder how he could love such as I. How he could have come down to earth to die for me and for you. How he who was perfect could have deigned to bear my sin and yours in his own body. How the wonderful work of God could have sought us out and chosen us. It's a mystery. It's hidden from the ages. Great is the mystery of godliness. And yet within it there's such a joy. There's such a certainty. I know that God loves me. I know that I'm his. I know he's mine. I know that I'm set free from the powers of sin and the ravages of the devil. I know that I'm different. But also I know I'm human. I know I live. That's the great mystery. Why did God, that great divine spirit, the glorious creator of heaven and earth, deign to come down to man? Why did he choose out man? Why didn't he choose an angel? who had nothing of weakness in him? Why didn't he choose one of the wonderful cherubims or seraphims? Why didn't he choose one of the mighty archangels? Why did he choose us? Why did he choose mankind? Why did he set his love and his store by man? I don't know. That's the miracle of it all. Why did he choose to come and take on human flesh? I don't understand. Why did he choose to come down to earth? Because he loved us. Why did he love us? A mystery. But God in his great love and his great wisdom and in all the wonder of his grace chose us out. But he didn't choose us out to make us anything other than Christians. He didn't try to make you or I anything more than a human being. He doesn't try to make us something that we can't be. He doesn't demand that we become angels. He doesn't demand we become cherubims or seraphims. He doesn't demand that we live above the realm of the body and the flesh. Though, of course, we don't live according to it now. We live according to the glorious teachings of Jesus Christ. But we're still human, aren't we? Amen? And he loves us. He loves us with all our humanity, with all the trappings that are around us, with all the seeming weaknesses and failures, with all the things that would seem to drag us down, he loves us. And you know they don't matter to him. He doesn't care. For if they had have mattered, he'd never have sought us out on Calvary's cross. He'd never have shed his blood. 
You see, he has a greater insight than we ever have. He sees beyond what a man is into what he's going to make him. He sees beyond what a man now has into what he shall become. For he has all wisdom, he has all knowledge, foreknowledge. He doesn't choose the good of this world, he doesn't choose the, the so-called holy of this world. He doesn't choose the things that have established themselves, he chooses the things that are not. The things that are despised and rejected. The people who aren't understood, those he chooses. And somehow within our hearts and within our beings there's a cry after God. We don't know how it got there. We don't know what causes us to respond and to say amen. I want that. I want to love him. I want to know him. I want to be part of him. I want my whole being to be caught up in him. I want to give my life for him. What causes a man to have that desire? Who knows? But it's there. It's somehow burst in us. And when we come to that knowledge, somehow we know we've always been destined for that. It's always been our end. It's what we were born for. It's what we were created for. It's something that we know within us before we were born. Paul wrote, God who separated me from my mother's womb. He knew before I was born said in the scripture before they'd done good or evil God said Jacob have I loved Esau have I hated that it might be of election of grace God foreknew and with each one of us he foreknows and chooses us before our birth and yet there comes a day when we hear the glorious gospel and our hearts light up and our souls respond. Why didn't it happen years before? Who knows? But in the fullness of time, God sends his Son to speak the word of life in our hearts. And there comes a quickening fire. There comes a bursting forth and suddenly our, our minds comprehend. Suddenly our hearts rejoice. Suddenly our whole beings get caught up. Suddenly we believe. And yet a day before we couldn't have believed. A week before we couldn't have understood. And suddenly we know it's going to be part of us. It's a great mystery. But it's wonderful. It's a mystery that's been hid from the ages. Who can understand it? Who can say why you're here? Why God called you? Why God chose you out? What was there in you that was worth choosing? Nothing. And yet God chose you. And that's the mystery. Who can say why he chooses one and puts down another? I'm sure we can all look round and say, but surely that person's far more able, far more uh, capable, far more deserving. So we may be in man's eyes. But God sees the inward secret. God chooses through the inward things. He doesn't judge with the seeing of the eyes. He doesn't judge with the hearing of the ears. He doesn't judge according to natural things. Spirituals, he just chooses. He just makes a choice and decides and that's it. And God set his seal, his chosen people out. Great mystery. That's the thing that's the mystery that's been hidden from all ages. Why did he choose you? What was there about you that was so special? Nothing. <laughs> What's there about you that's so beautiful? Nothing. What's there about you that's so responsive? Nothing. What's there about you that causes you to be one of those that's chosen? Nothing. 
then why did he choose you? Because God chooses whom he will. And he decided he was going to choose you. And at that point, he chose you. At the beginning, before the creation of the world, he chose you in Christ Jesus. Did you know that? It wasn't left to chance. He didn't wait to see what choice you'd make. He chose you. Before all eternity was, when he was sitting in glory, and the angels were round him, and the cherubim and the seraphim, before ever there was sin, before ever the cherubim, choice in heaven, lifted up his heart against God. He sat there and in the great councils and annals of God, he decided that he'd choose you. He said in one year, whatever year it be, so and so's going to be born. He'll be one of my choice ones, or she'll be one of my choice ones. I'll draw her. I'll bring her to life. I'll bring him to life. It's going to amaze those around them. They won't understand. But they're chosen out as choice vessels for me. And in all eternity, he wrote that book of life. He put your name and my name in it. And he said, these are going to be my choice ones. And he sealed the book so no one could read it. The angels couldn't peer in. The cherubim couldn't steal it. For he'd have attempted to destroy those who God had chosen. He even designated the time of our salvation. He even chose the time of our birth. He chose that our father and mother would marry. He chose how we'd be born into this earth. He chose what would happen through all our circumstances. And he chose the time when he would meet with us. He chose where we'd live. He chose what we'd do. He chose everything about us. He put into our lives experiences, some good, some not so good, but all chosen by his hand to bring us to the place where we would respond to him. And he loves us. Isn't that wonderful? Why should the creator of heaven and earth choose us? Because he did. What's special? Well, we're special to him. What's peculiar about us? Well, we've been called to be a peculiar or set apart people. Why? Because he said, in that day, I'm going to have them. I'm going to have them as my people. They're going to be my people. I'm going to draw them from the four corners of the earth. I'm going to draw them. And he has. How many of us wonder why we're here? How many of us can look back and say, well, if this hadn't happened, if God hadn't done that, if God hadn't taken me through that, if those things in my life hadn't occurred, well, I'd never have met him. And yet they did occur. Those circumstances happened. You know, while I was away on holiday, I began to think back. I live in Onga only because of one thing. Only in Onga could my wife and I find a house that we could afford at the time. It was the last place we wanted to live. You say, well, didn't you seek God's will? No, he forced it on us. But when 
we realized it was the only place we said well Lord here's where we'll set up our abode and so we did you say well didn't you have a choice well not really did you <laughs> and how are we here what for what reason because God said I'm going to establish my life in that place but why well he just decided you say well surely we don't follow a man you do understand it and understand it well you follow a man God always ordained that you'd have to follow a man you say well surely we only follow God huh? ah, no surely we're only called to God not at all well surely we're Christians we have our own relationship with God no way my friend here's another great mystery you say well I don't like that you might not but it's the truth and I want to share this morning some truths that have come home to my heart and you know it causes my mouth to sing and my heart to laugh when I realize them I begin to get so full of joy and so realizing what God has got everything in the palm of his hand that there is no accident in life in God if I'm called of him that nothing can happen to me but it's God's purpose that he has his purposes to outwork great mysteries Lord you've caused my heart to laugh and made my mouth to sing I want to share some truths that you won't like but I never asked you to like things they're truths that are unfair but whoever said God was fair in man's terms there is no fairness with God who art thou O man that would answer against God who art thou who's been his counsellor are you one who's instructed him in his ways of course not the great mystery the glorious mystery of the secrets of God he's chosen you and he's chosen me do you know it do you know it really it's all revealed in his wonderful book we're going to turn to Romans chapter uh, chapter let's start in chapter 10 Roman no we'll start in uh, um, Genesis as I was thinking this morning and um, uh, you remember we were in Genesis 17 and you, you remember the story of Abram and we were in Abram just before we went on holiday um, we were in the story of Abram should I say um, just before we went on holiday and when we return we find ourselves still in him Abram uh, Genesis chapter 17 verse 1 and when Abram was 90 years old and 9 the Lord appeared to him and said unto him I am the, the almighty God walk before me and be thou perfect Amen and you'll remember if you're a Bible student that in I think it's something like uh, Genesis 35 you'll find that um, God uses that name El Shaddai for the second time in scripture when he appears to Jacob and he changes Jacob's name to Israel and always where God appears as the almighty God or that name is used in the Hebrew El Shaddai you will find that it always has to do with the change of nature and here you remember that he changes Abram's name verse 5 neither shall thy name uh, anymore be called Abram but thou, thy name shall be called Abraham 
Amen? And you remember Sarah gets a change of name too in verse 15. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarah thy wife, thou shalt not call his name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And God appeared as the Lord God Almighty to Abram. Now the amazing thing about Abram, you remember, was that he came out of Ur of the Coles, didn't he? Do you remember the story? Now they were idolaters. They lived in idolatry and they weren't any special people. And you remember we've gone along in the story of Abram and always Abram has entered into unbelief, hasn't he? He pretended that Sarah was his sister and not his wife and upset Pharaoh's household and upset Abimelech's household. Remember the stories? He pretended uh, because he wanted it through fear to save his own life. Uh, he went and took Lot as compromise. So all the time Abram wasn't exactly what you would call a lily white individual. He didn't do everything right. But the amazing thing is God chose him. Now why did he choose him to create a nation and to birth a nation, the Jewish nation? Why choose Abram? Why not choose anyone else? Tom, Dick or Harry? Well, because God chooses whom he will. And that's a great mystery. God chooses a man because he chooses to set his name upon that man. And you cannot argue with it. You can't get round it. There's no uh, excuses. There's no explanations. He doesn't even attempt to justify his choice. In fact, you know, uh, that's why I know the Bible's true. One of the reasons. Because God when he writes the scripture, doesn't only tell us the good about people, he tells us their mistakes and their blemishes too. I mean, look at uh, King David. And the scripture says he was a man after God's own heart. And yet, David numbered the people against God's commandment and caught a plague to fall on the people, which wiped out hundreds of thousands. He, he um, went and stole someone else's wife. He did all sorts of things. He ate the showbread that was forbidden. In fact, um, he had great uh, courage given him when he faced Goliath, didn't he? And yet he ran from Saul. That's great, you know, great mystery. And yet God had chosen him. He hid in caves. He took all the thieves and the robbers and the vagabonds and anyone that was in debt and he made an army out of them. And they became the choice men of God. Great mystery. But that's the way God is. He chooses whom he will. And then he picks up another one, Elisha. There was the school of the prophets. Elijah had a school of prophets. They're all trained up in how to move in prophetic gift and flow, how to do this, how to do that. In fact, they're rather like, um, we'd say today, you know, they'd been to university and they got ordained into the Babylonish, uh, the Anglican Church or the Catholic Church or the Babylonish Church, call it what you will, uh, or this denomination or that abomination. And they'd all got together and they'd set themselves and then God decides he'll choose someone else. He bypasses that crowd. He says, well, I'm not interested. How about this old fellow here? He suits me. You say, well, oh, Lord, he hadn't got qualifications. Good. He's all mixed up. Better. He's not the type of person you should ever choose. Quite right. God chooses the things that are not as though they were. And the things that are, he sets at naught. And that's the way God is. Say, so, well, it's unreasonable. Quite right. But you see, then the glory can be of God and not of man. If he chose the most intellectual, the greatest, the most um, humanly sweet person, 
then of course you'd find that um, the person could take credit for what God does, but he chooses the are not, the rejects. I'd sometimes drive to Heathrow Airport, and I always pass a shop on the way through Knightsbridge. It's called the reject shop. That's where God goes shopping for his saints. He chooses them out. That's where his blood purchases, at the reject shop. He never chooses the things that are, are right. He chooses the things that are wrong. Now, you might look at a brother or a sister and say, well, I don't like this about them, or I don't like that. You might not. Now, that doesn't alter the fact that God chose them. Say, well, why didn't he choose someone with a bit more graciousness? Because he chose someone in an Elite. Say, well, I don't agree. No, you might not. Hard luck. So, oh, doesn't seem reasonable. Of course it isn't. I mean, it's totally unreasonable, isn't it? When you think about it, what? reason have you got to justify your being saved? None at all. Have you? And that's the mystery. Great is the mystery. And it excites me and thrills me when I realize, and God chose this man, 99 years old, not never sired a son with Sarah, and he tells him 25 years before, he says, Abram, you're going to be the father of mighty nation. And for 25 years, he leaves him alone. And when he's so old that, uh, you know, and uh, his wife is past it, then he comes back and he says, all right. And he says, I'm still going to do it. But at that point, you'd think it was impossible. Well, it was. And God chooses the people that are unqualified for what he calls them to. The qualified ones he can't use. Because the qualified ones have used their qualifications. The unqualified ones are too dumb. They have to rely on faith. And therefore, they come along with no pre preconceived ideas and uh, they muddle through somehow and they seek God's face and God says this and they say, okay, God, and they're stupid enough to go on and believe it and do it. But the smart Alex, who can work out all their doctrine, they say, oh, no, 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 I can't do that. You know, I'm, I mean, fancy eating with unwashing hands and fancy healing on the Sabbath day and, oh, dear, you can't walk about with publicans and sinners. Fancy going into a pub. I mean, fancy... Um, Drinking? Why? I mean, you know, you ought to drink water. Mind you, in this day and age, they mix fluoride with it to give you cancer after a few years, so it's not worth drinking water. Better to drink wine. You're more likely to stay healthy. And, and you, you realize all, all types of things. God just says, well, I'll do this, I'll do that. And he does it all the wrong way chooses out the people that he should never choose. Upsets your doctrines. Upsets Christendom. They all get upset. I, when I go over to America, I find in the pulpits in America that there's one thing that there is that uh, amazed me. And that is, I've never seen so many fine mohair suits except behind the pulpit. I mean, these guys, they dress so sharp. Uh, I, and when I say sharp, I look like an old rag bin. I get up there, you know, and I went to one church and I wore a brown suit and I didn't know you were meant to wear blue if you were preaching. They all wear, you know, and, and they're so, um, they're so polite. And they say all the right things and they have a beautiful way with words and they can uh, charm birds out of trees and they, they have honey. 
and it amazes me. You go to their churches and you preach the truth and they get upset. They say, hey, if you carry on like this, I'll have to give up my Peugeot 604 and my uh, swell house and all my clothes and, and this and that and the other. Don't you realize you'll ruin my living? And you wonder, God didn't choose that lot, did he? And yet they're there. And I want to talk about the lot that he did choose. He never chose Lot, he chose Abram. But I want to talk about the lot, the small L, that he did choose. And um, if we go to Romans chapter 10, um, or oh, we'll start in chapter 11. Uh, well, I've just got to think. Uh, let me see. Um, I just love these scriptures, you know. Um, uh, let's chat, start, we can go all around Romans, but we'll start in chapter 9. I'll just take 9 for a start because it probably links in with um, what I was saying earlier. Um, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. Now, I want you to know I'm not telling you lies. Uh, nor was Paul. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. All right, that I have, continue, continue, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Um, now, I want to tell you that Paul had continual sorrow in his heart for his brethren, the Jews. I don't have continual sorrow in my heart for the Jewish people. Now, let me be honest, God hasn't put it there. Now, if someone thinks that God's put it there, then fine for them. God put it in Paul's heart, he hasn't put it in mine. God has put a cry in my heart that he'll raise up a true people of God in this country. But he hasn't put a cry in my heart for the Jews in Israel. Now, I know that there are some people that claim to have it. I believe that the time of the Jews is not yet. And it's the time of the Gentiles. And the time of those, but I do know people who have been Jewish who are converted. When we went to Israel, we met Christians who were Jews. And Christ had suddenly revealed himself to them. And he chooses out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and tribe. And then um, we go on. And... Uh, who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenant in verse 4 and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Whose are the fathers and of whom concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all? God be blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children but in Isaac shall I seed be called. That is, they which are, of, uh, are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Now, who are counted for the seed? Children of the promise. Now, you'll remember, when Abram took Hagar, we got Ishmael, and we get the Arabs. But, what Paul is saying here is, listen here, not everyone's of the seed just because they come by descendancy out of Abram. It's the ones who have promised. And that's a wonderful thing. Do you know you're a child of promise if you're born in Christ? You were in him before the foundation of the world and your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're a child of the promise. You always were. And you say, well, how is that so? Well, read on. If you don't believe me, all you have to do, eyes down. And um, for this is the word of promise. 
At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by her father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it is said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Amen. Now what have they done, these children? What have they done? Nothing. They weren't born. They were conceived, they were in a womb, and at that time God decided that the elder was going to serve the younger, and God also decided that he loved one and hated the other. So, well, that's a bit rough. Hmm, it is. But God has foreknowledge. He knows what you'll choose. And he knows the way you'll behave and respond. That's how he can choose. He has all knowledge. Let's go on then. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Now isn't that amazing? Lots of people say to me, well, I chose God. I want to tell you, you didn't choose him. He chose you. Say, well, I responded and sought God. Oh, no, you didn't. He sought you. Say, well, I've always sought God. Liar. God seeks you. It's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth. It's God who shows mercy. Did you realize your salvation is totally, completely, absolutely, and always of God? It's nothing to do with you. It's nothing to do with what you do. It's nothing to do with what you've done. It's nothing to do with what you think. God decides you're one of his chosen, and he's chosen you are. And you remember, we're going on, you know, a little later on to study the scriptures of Jacob and Esau, but Jacob was the biggest twister, the biggest crook you could ever come across in his dealings and God chose him and God said uh, Jacob of I love and Esau well he was a hunter he used to go out hunting in the fields and enjoying his life and living it to the full and God hated him something to bear in mind I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. 4 verse 17, the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Do you know poor old Pharaoh was a vessel for dishonor, and God raised him up so he wouldn't let the children of Israel go. Now the reason God raised that man up to oppose the children of God was that he could show forth his power and his glory. God selected him. No one gets into any position unless God puts him there. God selected him and said, right, now I'll, I'll, I'll put that person there. I'll show my power. And you remember that the miracles that Moses did before the children of Israel were let go and came out um, to the promised land and were let go from Egypt Pharaoh was specially selected to harden his heart and refuse to let the people go says so look around, eyes down um, therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will he hardeneth now here's something that um, my wife sometimes says to me she says lovey 
Why doesn't it worry you when things happen and people seem to go against the ways of God? My wife gets a bit worried about it and says, well, you know, why don't, don't, doesn't it ever bother you? And I say, no. Uh, when I see people going wrong, it doesn't bother me. And she wonders at that. But you think, I'll fight for them, I'll, I'll tell them the truth, I'll try and draw them out of their error. But in the end, God hardens and God causes them to respond. And there's nothing I can do to change God's foreordained will. Nothing I can do about it. If he chooses to harden them, that's it. So I'm faithful because I don't know who he will harden and who he's going to have mercy on. Do you? That's the mystery. If he let me into that secret, it would make preaching the gospel a lot easier. If he could just drop down an electoral roll with all the names kind of emblazoned in gold and say, these are the ones who will respond, Mike. Now we'll work together on this. I'd say, thank you, Father, that saves me a lot of effort. But he doesn't do that. He says, you preach to every creature. Now there's going to be some that I'm going to have mercy on and there's going to be others that I'm going to harden. And you think, well, I, <laughs> you know, why don't you tell me? Well, he likes to keep secrets. And that's one of them. Great is the mystery of godliness. And he hides this from us. We don't know. When I meet people, I tell you something that I do know. I know when someone's heart begins to harden and they stop responding to truth. But I don't know that a year down the line he might not have mercy on that person. And it just wasn't their time. Others seem to respond and seem like the seed that falls by the wayside. They spring up quickly, but when the sun comes up and persecution and tribulation and difficulty, they wither away. And hearts become very hard then. But you can't tell who's which. That's one of the glorious things. You just have to keep going on. Keep sowing the seed, keep preaching the gospel, and God will save whom he will, and whom he won't, he'll harden, and that's it. And it's good, because you see, the responsibility is God's, not mine. You say, well, isn't it your responsibility to shepherd them? Well, in a way, yes. But I can't cause someone to respond if they don't want to. Just got to leave them. If they start hardening their heart against truth and won't listen to me, then I know that God's withdrawn his mercy. And that's the end. Well, that's rough. That's it. Just say goodbye to them. God bless you. I hope you find somewhere where you'll be happy. <laughs> but I know that there's no way they'll go to a Christless eternity. Nothing I can do. Say, well, doesn't it upset you? Well, no, actually, it doesn't. Well, don't you feel something? Well, no, not really. So, well, are you unfeeling? Well, probably. On the other hand, I just want God's will to be worked out in the earth. And therefore, I don't want to fight against God. Do you? If he decides to harden someone's heart, well, that's up to him. It's not my job to answer against him. In fact, it goes on to say, and here we are, eyes bound. Um, nay! Oh, just a minute. We'll go verse 18. Therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Now, that's a good question, isn't it? If he hardeneth whom he will, 
and he has mercy on whom he will, then why does he find fault with the people who don't respond? It answers it here. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honour and another unto dishonour? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endureth with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom he hath called not only of the Jews, but also of the Gentiles, as he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which were not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, and there are vessels to honour and vessels to dishonour. And that's the way it is. Some vessels are fitted for destruction. Other vessels are fitted for honour. And God just selects them. Now you're one or the other. Before the foundation of the world, you were fitted for one thing or the other. Say, well, I don't like that type of teaching. You might not like it, but it's the truth. It means that God has total power. Of course he does. He always has been sovereign. Did you think you were, darling? Think you had control over your life? Think you could choose anything yourself? How stupid and infantile you are. You had no control over the fact that Jesus Christ came to earth and died for your sin, did you? To be the great sin bearer? You couldn't have influenced that, could you? You couldn't have caused him to come and take your sin and my sin into himself on Calvary's cross, could you? In fact, you couldn't have even caused your own birth, could you? You couldn't have caused yourself to breathe when you were born. God gave you that. You didn't choose what shape you were going to turn out. And some of you have turned out very funny shapes. But there you are. You didn't choose it. You developed that way. The long, the short, the fat, and the thin. You had no choice. It just happened. Didn't it? Hmm? Some go bald early. Some keep all their hair. Some put on weight easily. Others don't. Some are intelligent. Others <laughs> aren't. Some have this, some have that. Some have blue eyes, some have brown eyes. And you didn't have a choice over any of it, did you? In fact, you don't even have a choice over the people you fall in love with. It happens. Why did you choose this person and not that? How come you ended up lumbered with them and not someone else? I mean, you know, it just happens, doesn't it? But it's all foreordained of God. Do you know, God selects who's going to marry who. And I want to tell you something else. He even selects the children. Because if they're foreordained before the foundation of the world, he's very careful. Some of the seed are the seed of the devil. And they'll turn out awful. And make no mistake about it, um, you know, you might have read in the papers about Sutcliffe, that murderer, the Yorkshire Ripper. He was the seed of the serpent. Now it was his father's and mother's fault. You 
you understand that and understand it well, don't think that they were all innocent. They weren't. The line of iniquity goes down. Of course, when you're born of God and when you accept Jesus Christ, the line of iniquity is broken at the point where you accept Christ. And from that point on, your seed becomes the seed of God. And even if your children were born before your conversion and at the point where you respond to Christ, your children have the power of sin and the iniquity line cut off. Of course, they still have to have an experience of regeneration and they have to come to Christ, but the line of iniquity that you got through your forebears is broken. And you remember God said that the line of iniquity passes to the third and fourth generation. In Christ it is broken at the generation that responds to him. That's a wonderful thing. And you say, well, what about where there's only one parent that believes? Well, do you realize that if one parent believes and responds to Christ, then it breaks the line of iniquity in the children anyway. God sanctifies the unbelieving with the believing. And that's a great mystery. How does he do it? I mean, how is it that this line of iniquity is broken? Well, God does it. Well, how does he do it? I don't know. Well, why does it work? Well, I don't know. But you will find that if you go to somewhere and you trace back the genealogy of people, you'll discover that the worst criminals came out of criminal lines. And you'll find back, they've traced it back, psychologists and psychiatrists, they have time to do it in America. They've traced it back. And they've also traced back of the line of people who, who are godly people and have been used in revival, and they've traced their seed down. And surprisingly enough, their seed produces the good. And I believe there's two seeds on the earth. Or let's say three. I believe there's a seed of God. There's a seed of the serpent. And then there's what I would call neutral seed, fair game. There are people who are just devil inspired from birth. That's genetically put on them. Of course, if they respond to Christ and they're one of the chosen vessels, they'll come into Christ and they'll be changed. But it's great mystery. Isn't that wonderful? No? Don't you find it wonderful that God can choose you before the creation of the world? That somehow, how many of you, now let's just see, how many of you know now that after you were born again you realize that God caused many things to happen in your life all in preparation for your meeting with him? How many of you found that? Put up your hands, right up, those that found that there was that, can you see? Now as you start looking round, you realize that nearly everyone has had that experience and realizes it. Now, isn't it amazing? And yet, before you were born again, you'd have said, well, you know, nothing. It's only after you're in that you realize that somehow you always were from the day of your birth. There was something different about you. Hmm? How many realized that? I did. I mean, I look back and I can see God's hand on my life. I know that even though I was an unbeliever in the sense that I had this niggle down inside that told me what was right and wrong, and I knew that I belonged to God. At the age of seven, I fell in the sea. And the sea was consuming me because it was 15 foot deep and I couldn't swim. And I thought I was about to become meat for the fishes because I couldn't see myself getting out. And one of the amazing things was, as I was going down, I remember I was just going into unconsciousness and I looked up and I saw the bubbles going up and I knew that was the last of my hair. I held my breath and I couldn't hold my breath any longer and I began to let it out and I remember saying in my own childlike way, oh God, here I come. Now, 
I knew I was God. And yet I'd never been to church, I'd never been involved with Christian things, but I knew I was God. The amazing thing was that God had chosen me before the foundation of the world. And so he let a little hand go above the water. And a woman who was sitting on the top of the promenade looked down and she saw her hand just break the surface and immediately she knew that I was drowning and no one else saw it. She threw off her towel and she dived straight off a 20-foot promenade into the sea and pulled me out. Now, I was selected before the foundation of the world. The devil wanted to kill me. But God had written my name in the Lamb's Book of Life and he couldn't. He knew that there were angels guarding my life. He knew I was selected, so he wanted to destroy me. So he sent a wave to take me off a promenade and wash me down. And he thought he could kill me. But God had other angels, and one angel banged this woman on the shoulder and said, See that hand? There's a child drowning. Get it. It's mine. So she did. And that's a great mystery. Say, well, do you really believe that? Of course I do. I've known miraculous experiences where the angels have come down and protected my life, even when I was doing the wrongest things in the world. They knew. You see, God had sent his guardian angel, and you've got an angel that guards you. And if you're in the Lamb's book of life, there's nothing that can take your life. You're protected. You're garrisoned. There's no way they can steal you until it's God's time to take you home. I remember years ago too, I, when I was a lot older, and I was driving over a... Uh, well, I wasn't driving, someone was driving over a hill. And uh, uh, I had I'd bought a Fiat 500 and downhill you could get it up to 60 miles an hour, 65 and we were belting down and I remember we used to go across to visit a place where this fellow's girlfriend was and we'd stay the weekend and we'd get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to come home so we'd be in time for work on Monday morning and I remember coming over this hill and as I, as we came over the hill I saw a bus park and it was going the same way as us, but it was stopped at a bus stop. Must by that time, I suppose, being 6.30. And as I saw it parked there, I said, Watch out! Watch out! Stop! And he said, It's all right! And he carried on. And I knew, and as sure as anything, round the corner came a lorry doing about 60 miles an hour. And they're just in Little Yorkshire Dales or Wally Skipton Bypass. If ever you've been over it, there's no room even for a Fiat 500 to go between a bus and a lorry and all down the walls there was no pavement there was just these stone walls you know the kind of flint walls they have about so high there was no way out and we were coming at 60 miles an hour and the lorry was coming about 60 and it was obvious we were going to meet just about level with the bus now, in a Fiat 500, when you're meeting a big lorry, uh, and the lorry had come down the hill to go up, and it had come just around this bend, and there was no way. It was kind of racing, to, so it got a good pull up the hill. And I remember this chap just putting his foot on the brake, and we began to spin. And we spun round and round and the amazing thing happened we hurtled still spinning towards this lorry which was coming towards us and then all of a sudden we were picked up bodily as a whole car and there was 10 to 12 foot of ditch with no wall and we were picked up and we were just dropped in the ditch and the lorry went whistling by us and it missed us by two foot. And we were facing the wrong way in the car, not even shaken, no jolt, nothing. Just dropped in the ditch and the car hadn't even got a scratch on it. 
and the lorry driver was pale and he came running back and we were sitting in the car, the pair of us laughing. And this lorry driver came running back and he was ashen white. And he graced back and he used one or two words which I won't repeat. But he said, there's not room to do that on this road, mate. <laughs> I think we realized. But you see, God had got my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the enemy wasn't going to rub it out of it even for someone else who did something they shouldn't have done. God's protecting hand was there, and he said, oops, and okay, it made the angels work overtime, and they had to be a bit quick. And the driver of the lorry said we, he missed us by about 12 inches. He could not believe it. He watched the car spin, and he knew he was going to hit it, and he tried to brake, and he stopped 30 yards down the road before he could pull up his lorry. Now, I know that the angels care. And I can give many instances where the enemies try to wipe my life out. But you know he tries that with everyone that's called of God. And this is a mystery. If you think about it, and you begin to look through the scriptures, you'll find anyone that has a real call of God, the enemy tries to liquidate them before they have a chance to fulfill their call. Take Moses. Hmm? Now, do you remember? There was a command to slay every man-child. Take any of the people that have a call of God set upon them. Take Daniel, for instance. He should have been slain. He was one of the princes. He ended up in the king's house. He got thrown in the lion's den. They, they did everything to destroy Daniel. Any of the prophets, Isaiah, Elijah, Elisha, the enemy tries to snap out their life before they have a chance. And then, of course, all the way down the line. But the glorious thing is, do you remember Elisha with his servant there and, and all the Syrian horse around and the old servant's knees began to knock together. Probably sounded like a pair of cymbals, his kneecaps. And there he was, shaking. And, and Elijah said, Oh, God, open their eyes! And when he opened his eyes, he looked. And the whole of the hills were surrounded with angels, with fiery chariots. All ready to protect one man! <laughs> do you know when Jesus was on earth they tried to snuff out his life before time do you remember the time they tried to throw him over a cliff they took up stones to stone him and they went to throw him over the cliff and it says he just passed through the midst of them the angels just bound all the people and he just walked straight through them and away but how do you walk away from a multitude that's trying to throw you over a cliff the angels just came and they bound everyone. Isn't it wonderful? There are times where, I mean, how can you live in a den of lions that are hungry and you're the only food around? I mean, you know, if something doesn't happen and they weren't suffering from lockjaw, you know, they, something, they got lockjaw, all right, the angels shut their mouths. God shut their mouths. And God has total control. Why? Because before the foundation of the world, your name was in the Lamb's Book of Life. You couldn't be killed. You didn't know it. And don't try it. Don't jump off a building and say, well, I'm in the Lamb's Book of Life. You might find when you hit the bottom that God decided at that point your name was rubbed out. And so were you. You can't tempt God. You see, the saint knew the principle because he said to Jesus, go up and cast yourself off the pin pinnacle of the temple. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. So the devil knew that Jesus Christ was protected by angels and his life couldn't be taken until God took it. But he also knew that if Jesus went 
and did things willfully against God's will that he could step out. And that's the great mystery. You see, I must live according to God's will. But I know that his angels have got charge over me. Amen. I know that years ago my name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life and there's nothing that they can do about it. The enemy can fume, he can puff and puff and blow. He can do all manner of things, but one thing he can't do, he can't get round the angels of God that protect me. He can't touch me. He can't take my life. Now God might at occasion bring the fence in a bit to test me but he can't touch my life. You remember Job, um, the enemy came and said, ah, has Job got, loved God for naught? And God just brought the fence in. He never removed it. He said, you cannot touch his life. Amen. When you know you're God, you know you're protected. Glory to God. And if something happens, when well, God brings the fence in a bit, well, God has brought the fence in, but your life's in his hands, my friend. Isn't that wonderful? Doesn't it give you confidence? No? Hmm? It does with me. I remember my wife telling me she was in a little beetle. Not a bug, but a beetle. A uh, Volkswagen. And she was driving down the motorway and the front tire blew out and she spun round and round and round and a uh, lorry missed her and she ended up facing the right way on the central reservation and she could have been killed but you see an angel had charge over her and the angel knew on October the 10th some year I think it was she was going to marry me now she was selected to be the one privileged to marry me and there was no way the enemy could rob me of her or her of me. No way. Now the enemy tried, but he lost. Oh, he gets so angry when he finds these angels around. Oh, it makes him mad when he can't wreak his vengeance because he hates the sons of light, but there's nothing he can do. Glory to God. I was chosen in him. You know, with Jacob, he tried to stir Esau up to murder Jacob. He did all sorts, but he never won, did he? Laban was as mean as anything to Jacob, and Jacob still came out on top. God has wonderful ways of preserving his saints. And we'll go on. We haven't quite finished this chapter. Um have to forgive me if I'm soliloquizing a bit, but there we are. Um, it goes on and it says, Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. And this is amazing. Um, that's verse 27, sorry, of Romans 9. Uh, Isaiah uh, crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall save. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Now here's an amazing thing. Out of all the people in Christendom so-called, you will find that the true Christians are a remnant. There's thousands upon thousands that go to church. You will find a very, very small remnant that love God and really follow him. You will find very few churches where the truth is really preached. Very few. You will find hundreds of thousands of churches where they preach a simple socialist gospel. But where truth is preached, it's a remnant. Amen. And let's just go on to... Um, uh, um, 
chapter 10, verse 1. I, I, there's so much, I'll skip a bit. But brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God, um, to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now what on earth does that mean, you might say? Well, look here. Righteousness is a right relationship with God. That's what it means. Righteousness is not a list of do's and don'ts. Don't do this, do do that, shouldn't do this, shan't do that. That is not anything to do with righteousness. That is to do with the law. Righteousness is a spirit. The spirit of Christ in me. And what I must be careful is that I don't go about to establish my righteousness but I get to know the righteousness which is of God. In other words, the indwelling spirit of God within me. I'm not made righteous because of what I do and what I don't do. I'm made righteous because of what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross. That's my righteousness. He's my righteousness, not my actions. My actions don't make me righteous. My actions have no effect on my righteousness. Shall I say it again? My actions have no effect on my righteousness. If I'm one of the chosen of God, I'm chosen of God because He chose me. Therefore, I'm in a right relationship if I've responded to his call. Now what I do and don't do won't affect that. Now what it will affect is my sanctification, which is another story. But my righteousness, it won't affect. My relationship with him, it doesn't affect at all. And I must be careful that I don't go about to establish my righteousness by doing what the Jews did. They made their faces sad, they fasted. They wouldn't, um, they, they were so pernickety over the law. Don't cook the food if you use this pot. Don't cook the food unless you use that pot. Um, don't, uh, you know, don't do this. Wash your hands before the meal. Um, you know, and they made it a ceremonial washing instead of a hygiene washing, which God had intended. They um, had ideas about wearing phylacteries, wearing clothes, and and, you know, reading the word of God and blowing a trumpet before they prayed and having their upper seats in the synagogue, all sorts of things, trying to establish a righteous attitude. They used to separate themselves from publicans and sinners. They wouldn't eat with them. They wouldn't let them in their house. They wouldn't do this. They wouldn't do that. They probably wouldn't have watched England play Switzerland. They probably would never have had a television in their house. They probably would never have um, deigned to, to go to a holiday camp because they'd have been with unrighteous people. But you see, that does not establish my righteousness or unrighteousness. My righteousness must be the righteousness of God. Now that's never been in dispute. God is righteous, isn't he? No one's ever disputed the holiness of God. That must be my righteousness. Now, my actions won't establish me in anything. That is why one of the most evil things in society is the do-gooders. They make you ill. They're always going about to establish their own righteousness, to be seen of men. They've got their great socialist principles. It is anti-God and anti-Christ. They're always trying to do good works and help people, but they're going about to establish their righteousness. I want the righteousness of God. Amen? Are you following what I'm saying? Is it clear to the simplest? Well, is it? Hmm? I mean, it might not be a doctrine you like, 
but no one asks you to like it, you're told to believe it. Every word of God is given by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Let me go on. Uh, for Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. Now this is not the righteousness of God, this is the righteousness of the law. Um, the man, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith, Speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend up into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from heaven, or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart, that, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Nothing to do with your actions at all. The words nigh you because God puts it there. When you confess it, it becomes a reality. You're saved. But not because you've done something or not done something, but because God has called you. And you accept his righteousness. Um, but if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth into righteousness. Now how do you get into righteousness? Hey? By believing God. But I thought it was by what I did. No. Well, don't my actions have anything to do with it? None at all. <laughs> it is a thing. I mean... It doesn't matter what you do, it's what you believe. Oh, doesn't it take the weight off your shoulders? Do you mean that I can be righteous just by accepting the Lordship of Jesus Christ and believing that God has raised him from the dead and that's it? Of course I do. You mean I don't have to do anything? Absolutely nothing. What, nothing at all? No. It's by faith. That's the wonderful thing. Now, if you want to be under the law, you'll have to live by it, and that'll be purgatory. But if you want to come to righteousness, which is of God, you just have to believe God, and he changes your nature. And with the mouth, and that's your mouth, not someone else's, Confession is made unto salvation. For what saith, um, for the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all them that call upon him. I want you to notice that God is rich to everyone who calls upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? Well, how can you call on someone who you haven't believed? Can you? You can't. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. That's what I said when I said a man has to come. How did you hear the gospel? A preacher was sent. Amen? And when you heard and believed and responded, you became righteous. You got a right relationship with God, but that preacher had to have one qualification. God sent him. And therefore, your salvation is dependent upon man. But it's totally of God. Because if a preacher wasn't sent, there's no way you'd get saved. But if the preacher who was sent didn't go, there's no way God would move. But he foreknew both. 
and forced both into the situation, one where the preacher who was sent had to go, and the other where you who had to hear got there. For he foreknew it. And so God is totally sovereign. And this is a great mystery. Isn't it? Hmm? And it is wonderful. You see, without the preacher, you're lost. Glory to God. But what's the use of having a preacher if he's not sent somewhere? And God has raised up. I mean, wouldn't it be ridiculous if God said, Michael, I've called you to preach my word. Go to Onga. And he sent me to Onga, and for ten years I remained there, and no one got saved. No one came to life, well, I would have to question whether I was sent. But when people respond, and they are called to the same place, and you realize that God is building his work and his church, he's doing it because he's got chosen vessels that will come and respond. You realize that the buildings of God. Jesus said, I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. He builds it. He does it. But he uses human instrumentality. And he uses us for his purposes. But he chose us out. Now the amazing thing is that the true preachers of God have never been the aesthetically nice ones. They never are. Because those type of people couldn't and wouldn't preach what God says. They wouldn't like it. The intellectual can't stand what God really says. They don't like the fact that they have no control over their own lives. The rejects don't care. They're just grateful that someone accepts them. That's the truth. It's the rejects, the only place where God ever shops. The things that are not, he calls as though they were. And he chooses us out before the foundation of the world. And when you realize it all, there's such a joy in it. Isn't there? Amen? And it's all so unreasonable. Glory to God. Thank God he's so different. Thank God I can be righteous, not by what I do. Now you might look at me and say, well, Michael did so and so, and I don't think that was right. Well, rhubarb to you. I don't give a mutt's monkey. You see, I'm not made righteous by what I do, I'm made righteous by what I believe. Say, well, I don't think he should do so and so. Well, maybe I shouldn't. But that doesn't affect my relationship with God, and you be careful. Who art thou that judges another? You can't afford to, because what I made righteous by is my belief. You have no business to judge your brother, in meat or in drink or in anything else. Understand it. You cannot judge. You have no room to. Because he stands or falls to his master, not to you. And he's made righteous by what he believes. And if God accepts his person, who are you to reject it? That's why I know people come and they don't like me. That's their problem, not mine. They don't agree with me. That's their problem, not mine. They think I'm too hard. Well, that's their problem, not mine. They don't like what I say. Well, that's their problem, not mine. Say, well, do you mean you can do what you like? No. But I can walk in a right relationship with God with a conscience void of offense, and no one can stumble me. I found God changed my nature inside. There's things now that I just wouldn't do. They're foreign to my nature. There's things I would do. Now, I'm not saying that sometimes uh, I don't do things that I, I find 
um, don't savor of the spirit of Christ. I mean, if someone grabs me round the neck, they're bound to get a smack in the mouth. Now afterwards, I might think I shouldn't have retaliated like that. But I'm, I'm still a human being. Well, Elijah took a sword and chopped off everyone's head. I didn't do that. It's only a smack in the mouth. You know, <laughs> you, you've got to look at it, you see, and, and realize we're all human. And I'm not deified so that I don't have human feelings. I get angry. But you can't afford to judge it. I'll retaliate to certain things, but you can't afford to judge it. God called me, and therefore I have a calling of God to preach the gospel. And you better believe it and respond to it, or go to hell. <laughs> Say, well, I don't like the way you do it. Well, that's your problem. I am what I am. I can't be any different. I remember when Jamie came to the church, first of all, you don't mind me choosing out someone, he said that what surprised him was I was in the pulpit what I was outside of it. And he said he'd never met anyone like that before who was what they were. But I can't be any different from what I am. I am what I am. And if you don't like it, lump it. But God gave me as a gift to you. And wasn't he generous? And, and do you know something else? You're given as a gift to me from God. And I've got the worst deal. And each of us has got to share with each other. Now we were foreordained before the foundation of the world. This was all selected out. No choices. I'm sure that if you wanted to really choose your pastor, you'd have chosen someone far better qualified and far nicer and more amenable. Tough. And if I had a choice, I'd have certainly chosen a people that were different. That's the way it is. But God's done it. And that's in the scripture. It's not a scripture that people spend very often looking at, do they? How many times have you heard that preached? Not very often, I wouldn't think. People don't like it. Sovereignty of God. That's why I love that song, Lord, you've caused my heart to laugh and made my mouth to sing. You know, it's you, Lord, that's done it all. You've chosen me. You've begotten me. You've selected me out to be one of yours. Can't figure out why you've done it, Lord. I don't deserve it. But I know this, it's not because of what I do, it's because of what I am. That I'm one of yours. Amen? And I think it's wonderful. Don't you? Don't you think it's wonderful that you're chosen in God before for the foundation of the world? No one can rob your life. Nothing can happen except God foreordains it. The enemy can't get at you unless God permits it. Hmm? That angels are guarding your every moment and every breath. That your righteousness is not established by what you do, but by what you believe. Now that's the greatest thing of all. That's the thing I love most of all. The fact that I'm made righteous by what I believe, not what I do. Hmm? That's how my nature changes. That's how God meets me. That gives you a great relief from the pressure of trying to obey the law. Of course, you'll be a fulfillment of the law because of a true belief in it. Changes your nature. But that's another story. I'm just preaching the aspect of righteousness. Right relationship to God. And if we can find Mary again, we'll sing, Lord, you've caused my heart to laugh and made my mouth to sing. I don't know if we're going to get her. Are we? Where is she? Here she comes. Dear, oh dear, I don't know. I don't know what they do. They go off for the day.
and don't even listen. Now she's coming back to play something. She doesn't know what we've said. Yeah. Do you realize you're one of the choice ones? There's no accounting for ten. <laughs> We're going to sing it. Lord, you caused my heart to laugh and make my mouth to sing. You know I can reach out in love to others when I realize that it's God's choice. I can be loving and kind and forgiving and accommodating when I realize that, well, whom he loveth, those he chooses. And those who he'll have mercy on, he'll have mercy on. And whom he hardeneth, well, they're going to go. What can I do? Just accept it. That's the great mystery. No good fighting about it or getting sorrowful about it or getting all upset about it. If they're hardened, they're hardened. Say, so, well, don't you have any feeling? Well, <laughs> probably not. I don't know. But, oh, God, I know you're sovereign. I know you care. I know you love me. I know I was begotten in you from the foundation of the world. I know I'm found in you. I know that you've selected me. I know that I'm special to you. I know that the angels guard me. There's nowhere I can be robbed of this salvation and life. You've made my heart to laugh and caused my mouth to sing. With the heart man believeth unto salvation. With the mouth confession is made. And it's as simple as that. When you realize you're righteous because of what you believe with your heart, you begin to laugh. When you realize the confession of your mouth is what brings salvation, you begin to sing. And the whole thing makes you a happy singing people. Free and easy. Free to live for him. Easy to love him.